For tonight, we're ready to get into the, the critique of, of uh, Marx's system of socialism. And, and to, just to set the stage, and I'll, I'll uh, bring up uh, some charts here in a moment. To set the stage, rem Mises wrote his critique of socialism in 1920. And at the time, uh, Marx had, had often, uh, in fact, wildly discouraged any uh, laying out of what a socialist society would look like. Uh, the utopian socialists often tried to do so, and, and he ridiculed them for, for that, because in, in much of the dynamicism of what would happen in this dialectic process, he said you really couldn't understand what, what was going to be, but it was going to be kind of the opposite of capitalism. But there was never a, a program to kind of throw out how it could look like. And so it was to this argument that Mises was making his point, because at this point, by 1920, uh, many of the nations in, in Europe especially had, had experienced kind of the, the war socialism, if you will, of World War I and, and, and saw how central planning directing a war effort had looked and, and there were some, some clear problems with that. But, but most obviously was the Bolshevik Rev Revolution in 1917. Uh, Lenin had actually uh, ceased the use of monetary calculation in, in, in uh, the, Soviet, the new Soviet Union. And that led to just unmitigated disaster. Uh, you may have read in, in the article tonight uh, his words that it was just chaos that was unfolding by all counts. Uh, 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 Lenin was forced to, to kind of shift that direction just a couple years after implementing because it was unmitigated uh, disaster when they tried to actually implement socialism with no money and, and so forth. So, so it's, it's to, to Marx's argument that Mises is making his critique. I say this just to set the stage. We're going to see people answer Mises' critique of socialism next class period, but they're going to make the argument a little bit different way, not what he was arguing against. And it's going to go back and forth a little bit, but, but it's important for you to understand Mises is, critiquing, Mises is critiquing the Marxian system of socialism. So that's where we're going to go. Uh, and I shouldn't have skipped the quote. Uh, we cannot act ec economically if we are not in a position to understand economizing. That is really a fundamental nature of what Mises is saying. Socialism, he, he's going to tell us, is impossible for rational economic calculation because there's no basis with which to do economic calculation in a socialist system. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk more on that. Okay, so first of all, we're going to review just kind of the summary points from the last lesson about what Marxian economics had, had, had offered. And then we're going to jump right into his critique. And I hope, if we have time, we can actually get to the, the discussion of Thomas Sowell's uh, Conflict of Visions, which I had assigned last time, but we did not have time to do. OK, so just to summarize uh, what we had covered last time, we saw some fundamental flaws in Marxian economics, mostly focused around how uh, Marx, Marx's system required the use of the labor theory of value to be some sort of objective measure and of, of value in the production process. Uh, and, and so it was, it was really interesting. We said he was the last of the classical economists because he, the, the classical economists had been looking for the labor theory of value as a way to make some sort of objective standard of value uh, that would explain why a, a good cost what it did. Uh, and, and, and it was unfortunate because as the last classical economist, he, he was writing, and, and really his, his, his version of Capital came out in 1867, and it was just at the very few years after that, in the early 1870s, we had the marginal revolution in economics, which really uh, changed the way we viewed value as a whole. So all the, the theories of an objective theory of value were gone and jettisoned, and, and, and yet that his whole system at a foundational level required a labor theory of value. So that's what we talked about last time. Uh, we saw that there was something called a transformation problem, uh, which suggested that capital-intensive industries uh, would be less profitable than labor-intensive industries, and yet historical reality says that's not true. You know, capital can flow from one industry to another. If there's, if there's a more remunerative uh, industry, you're going to have capital flow from the less remunerative to the more profitable, if you will. Uh, and that's what, what you would expect in, in, in economics, and that's what we indeed saw. He also had his, his flaw of, of, of asserting that the, the, this gets back to the labor theory of value, but only labor had value. And, and, and when you think about it, it's like this. So if I invited you over to my house, and I thought about bringing this prop, but I, I couldn't do this. And I said, we're going to have some great soup. 
and, 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 and I, I had in the, I had a pan, and picture in your mind, since I don't have this prop with me, uh, picture in your mind, that, that there would be uh, uh, s- some potatoes in this pan. And the potatoes in this pan would be all by themselves. No water, no salt, nothing else. And, and if I were to tell you uh, that uh, this soup would have, have a, uh, a, a value because of the potatoes, you would look at me and say, that's kind of ridiculous because I think I need a little bit more than potatoes there. And, and so if you think about it, it doesn't matter. In my own uh, house, uh, you may have your own favorite recipe. My wife has a, a, a spicy vegetable soup. And for us, the secret ingredient is spicy hot V8 juice. And I could say that that is the value of that soup is because of the spicy hot V8 juice. But it'd be ridiculous to say that there's not a contribution from the beef that's in there, the barley, the other kinds of ingredients that are essential to make that process. It would be completely arbitrary of me to say that the soup's value is because of the spicy hot V8 juice and not anything else. I could say that, but it would just be some arbitrary choice. And and that's kind of the nature of, of the problem here. If you have something that is the product of a joint operation with many productive inputs into the output, to say that only one of the inputs is part of the value of it is, is, is arbitrary by, by nature. And, and so his exclusion of capital, uh, as well as entrepreneurship, uh, is, is uh, fundamental to the, the flaw of that system. Because what we do see, and, and Bobovic, who's a, a great economist that came after him, kind of noted this, that, that in fact there is uh, interest and profits do have their natural reward. Interest because there is a reward to waiting. Uh, because if you're going to invest in capital, you're going to have uh, left the possibility of consuming earlier. Likewise, profit is seen to be valuable because workers get their wages in advance of sales. And those sales may never come. The entrepreneur may, may not get profit at all. You know, in, in a capitalist economy, there is profit and there is loss. And so, so there should be some sort of reward for that. And, and, it, and the way we left it last time, just to, to summarize, is, is within the, the Marxian framework, there's not a single idea that economics still uses as saying, hey, this is a, as an essential insight. Not that he didn't have some good insights, but as, as you contrast that to the other classical economists, I mean, Adam Smith is still foundational to economic theory. David Ricardo, with comparative advantage, is foundational to the way that we think about things. Uh, you know, we, we could go, go on and on with other economists who slowly, brick by brick, built up the foundation of economic systems. Marx is kind of way, way over to the side. There's, there's nothing of value that we consider in, in mainstream economics. So uh, I want to start off uh, by, by giving you an idea of uh, uh, this, this problem by watching a short video. I want you to read that quote for a moment. This video was an, kind of a, a modern analogy to a famous uh, article written by Leonard Reed, uh, I called I Pencil. And, and it's a story of how a pencil is made and something as simple as a pencil with just the, the graphite, the rubber, the brass, the, the wood, the complexity involved in something that simple was beyond any individual's ability to know how to make it without the cooperation uh, of of literally hundreds and hundreds of people in disparate industries uh, and and so forth. And and how much more the complexity of a cell phone as you start to get an appreciation from that. And and part of that is, as I hope you saw in there, uh, uh, in the video, you see all these potential trade-offs that that are there. You can start to imagine uh, you know, the, uh, the material found in one country, why that country and not another country? Why do we make the decisions that we do? It's often, and this is kind of going to get to the rash, part of the rationale why uh, socialism is attractive at a superficial level, because there is an assumption, especially amongst market economies, where we take for granted the very aspects where the price system works to provide kind of the, the ability to do these things, it, it, it's, it's 
it's out of sight. And so sometimes things that are out of sight, we would say they're out of mind. But yet they're not out of somebody's mind. And that's part of the critique that Mises is going to make. Mises is going to argue that uh, uh, th there are some fundamental problems with this. So, so here's, here's his argument in a nutshell. Uh, you read a, a fairly lengthy article, uh, but here, if we weren't, were to summarize Mises' critique, it would look like this. In socialism, by, by the very definition of what we mean by it, uh, we don't have private property in the means of production or the capital goods. And without private ownership of these means of production, there are no capital markets. There's no place where the bidding and competing, and this is very important, the competition for potential productive resources can be, can be made. And so there's, there's, without these capital markets, there's no prices available for these means of production. Uh, and, and so without the prices of the capital goods, that, that itself means there's no indicators of relative scarcity that, that of these productive inputs that should guide our production decisions. And his, his fourth point, without these relative scarcity indicators, there can be no economic calculation. And, and, and that gives us our summary, without private property, there is no rational economic calculation. And, 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 and it's a fairly simple uh, argument, but it's fairly profound. It does not mean that you can't uh, allocate capital goods uh, resources, right? But what it does mean, if this is true, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it and think about it a little bit, if it is true, it means that any allocation of resources is not based rationally on an, on an economizing basis. That's the heart of, of Mises' claim. And so uh, he, 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 the critique continues. Uh, he's going uh, he's gonna to attack first Marx's th labor theory of value as part of the problem. As we see here, Marx uh, is going to uh, assert this. You can see a quote that I've got there from Marx. Skilled labor counts only as intensified or rather multiplied simple labor so that a smaller quantity of skilled labor is equal to a larger quantity of simple labor. Experience, this is my emphasis there, experience shows that skilled labor can always be reduced in this way to the terms of simple labor. Uh, yet, yet uh, uh, Bobovrik says this is, this is stunning naivety, and, and Mises agreed with it, and I would have to uh, agree with that as well. Uh, and, and you can start to think about it. In other words, the, the most skilled labor position, we can think of it in terms of maybe a combination or a multiple of an unskilled labor. Well, that might make sense if you're talking about like uh, somebody, a skilled laborer that could drive a tractor, that could move certain amounts of steel or stone or so forth. We well, can imagine that we could get a, a, some set number of laborers that could do physically what the machine could, that one skilled laborer operating the machine could do. I think we could all agree to that. But when we go beyond that, how many, how many unskilled laborers could we do to replace, say, the 100 engineers that are designing a spaceship. That's a, that's a complete, completely different kind. It's qualitatively different. Uh, it's, it's not just going to be quantitative that you could, could uh, have, as he says, uh, intensified or rather multiplied simple labor. Uh, we could ask, how many day laborers could do Elon Musk's job? You know, think about an entrepreneurial kind of thing. Uh, it, it's not a function of the kind of uh, person that, uh, that uh, could do this in terms of the quantity of what they could do, where is the source of the creativity going to come forth? That, that is going to have to come forth out of the, the process. But, but even more fundamental than that, I don't want you to get, get uh, waylaid here too much in this, it's more than just uh, the, the uh, technical issue. So, so we can imagine, hey, the, the, day, the, the laborers that don't know how to make a spaceship, there's a technical lack of knowledge that somebody else does have. Mises' point is actually that it's, it's more than that, that the technical aspect, it's a value productivity. How do we know, how would we know that a spaceship is more valuable to produce than something else in the economy? That's the kind of the fundamental question. When we're talking about allocating resources, it's not just what the trade-off between the productive inputs are. It's, it's the trade-off between what they're going to produce. What's of use to society? How do we know this? 
in, in a way that, that is not completely arbitrary. And so uh, a, a final uh, kind of uh, critique from Mises is, is that Marx's system, by only valuing labor, doesn't steward other productive inputs. He gave an example uh, in, in his article that you know, two equally labor-intensive projects uh, would, would have the same sort of output and, and value in terms of labor value, but one would deplete natural resources at twice the rate of another. The Marxian system would have them both be the same value, and yet, if, if you're not stewarding the scarcity of fundamentally scarce resources like natural resources, you are not economizing. Economizing requires behavior that, that stewards all productive resources, not simply la labor. So that was part of his critique. Uh, so for Mises, the key to the labor theory of value is, is how do these different types of labor have value imputed without the market process? And can they be imputed? And, and his answer is no, they cannot. Okay, uh, and that, that, I just wanted to throw this, and you'll probably see it again. Uh, this is a, a quote from F.A. Hayek. It's a famous quote. Uh, we're we're going to get introduced to Hayek in, in subsequent, probably two, two classes from now, because he'll pick up Mises and follow on. But his quote now is, is really important. The curious ta task of economics is to demonstrate to men how little they really know about what they imagine they can design. Uh, this was out of his book, The Fatal Conceit, that he wrote in 1988. Uh, and, and so th there's really a, a fundamental lack of knowledge uh, to do the economizing role in the socialist system. Okay, so, so, so Mises allows for the consumer goods to be exchanged freely, even with money prices in the way he's going to lay out his argument. That is not what Marx kind of posited. Marx had made a, a more difficult uh, uh, position for himself, not explicitly in Capital, but one of his other works. He kind of suggested some workers you know, would, would work a certain amount of hours during the day. They would get some sort of coupons that are not money, but what could be exchanged for the consumer goods that, they, that would be uh, compensatory to the, the labor hours that they had worked. But Mises makes it easy. We can have money prices, in his argument, uh, but, but the real issue, and the reason why he kind of concedes that is, is that the consumer prices are easy. That's not the problem. The problem is the production of, of goods and services, those uh, means of production prices. Where do those come from? And, and since those are owned by the state, he, he says there's no market for these uh, producers' goods. Therefore, there's no monetary prices. And, and if you were to try, and we'll see uh, in, in, the next, in the next class period, we'll get to what, what are called the market socialists. Even if you were to assign a price to these means of production, it would be arbitrary because it would not be based on the rivalrous bids of, of uh, entrepreneurs that have certain expectations of what could be used for these resources. Uh, and, and so these forward-looking expectations are, 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 are where we, we start to get a social valuation of what these productive resources could do. And it gets a lot more knowledge built in, in the system. Another important point is, is Mises assumes good motivations on the part of all. Uh, the, the Marxist system kind of asserted that in, in this new socialist system, uh, with, without private property, you're going to have this, this new economic man that, that, that Marx uh, uh, alluded to, uh, and, and that would just do the right thing all the time. But, but there's, there's a well-known incentive problem. Uh, and it, basically, who's going to do the dirty job, right? You know, how do we get people to do the things no one else wants to do? Uh, so, so that's the incentive problem is, is certainly there. Uh, but, but he just is going to, we'll give them that. We're going to assume all the best intentions. People, each comrade will work as hard as they can towards the goal. Uh, the, the, the real question is, how will these central uh, planners allocate the, the productive inputs across the multitude of possibilities. So now we have some more illustrations, thanks to Witten running back and forgetting my uh, thing that I forgot to bring in. So uh, those of you that know me know I'm, I'm a little bit of a car guy, I'm a little bit of a tool guy. And so I brought some tools in. I will pass them around if you like. This one's not dirty, but it's used. Uh, these two. And, and I'm doing this because I'm assuming none of you are kind of like a tool aficionado like me. So you probably don't know which is the best and so forth. But 
the, kind of the problem is this. I've got two uh, uh, ratchets here. Uh, both of these are made in the USA. Both are quality, in my uh, opinion. Good metal, metal and everything else. Uh, well made. Yet one costs about twice as much the, as the other in, in, in a capitalist system. And the question might become, if you were the central planner, would you produce both of these? Remember uh, the, the quote that I had from, uh, from Bernie Sanders in his 2016 campaign, why do we need, I forget the number, like 23 kinds of deodorant and 15 kinds of shampoo or so. Why so many? Why not just one? These, if you look at both of them kind of move up and down, uh, both of them, uh, one's a little bit longer, but that's not the issue really, although that would be advantageous at some level. Uh, but, but both of them basically do the same function. Why are there two in a capitalist system? Which would you produce? And uh, you could go further. Uh, I have another. This is, a, uh, this is actually a quarter. It's, it's a little bit smaller than these. Assume that away for the interest of my observation. We'll say it's the same size and could do the same size socket. Uh, this one you would use with air pressure, and it would do a lot faster and so forth. How would a central planner know which one of these to use for any productive process? How many resources could we apply to the producing of one or the other? Uh, and I, I could show you in my, the, some of my other tools, I have uh, quite a few different kinds of saws that cut different costs, different values. All of them could be uh, uh, used uh, to go. Uh, my challenge to you is which one are you going to produce, central planner? Which one is, is the one that you ought to use? I will tell you without giving the name, one of those is approximately twice the price of the other, both good and quality, because one of them is made by, effectively, it's, it's, it's the, the actual producer, but not the name brand, as a snap-on, which is kind of a high-dollar tool, truck kind of thing. And, and the reason it goes for double is it's got a higher quality level. Uh, probably, I would never notice the difference, but I'm a, a kind of a hobbyist, out in the garage, but for some worker that makes their living on this, they can't afford for it to break, and oh, by the way, if it does break, there will be some truck there that day, sometime during the day, where they can exchange it and get a new one because their time is money. There's economic calculation that even the mechanic at the garage is doing to decide which type of tool would be appropriate for this purpose. And it's not that the cheaper one is inappropriate. It's appropriate for the purpose. Every day you all, and you don't have to get in tools, but you will make trade-offs about how much you want to invest in a given product. I, I suspect, not in this class because I was kind to you in the way I signed books, but in other classes you have tried to make trade-offs as to whether you would buy a textbook or rent a textbook or, God forbid, go without a textbook. Some of you might have done that too. Bless you. And, and, and so part of that is, is, is these trade-offs you're making is you've got a certain output you've got to get in terms of a grade, right? And there's limited resources. You're trying to steward well your time and, 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 and you've got to do that, but you're informed by the calculation of the cost because prices convey meaning to you. Prices convey to you alternative uses that could be out there. Uh, so, so now let's go to the second one. You've got tool time. You can keep looking at the tools. You just don't lose them. They're both really good. Uh, uh, I will tell you, it's, it's actually the, the Williams one that is the more production uh, unit. But the other one's a, a good unit as well. Uh, let's go to the second example. Let's say, and Mises, this was kind of Mises' example in, in the article. Let's say that you had to move goods from one place to another. I just chose Philadelphia to Los Angeles. The very first question you ought to ask yourself if you are a socialist central planner is, why am I moving anything at all? Why do I need something to go from Philadelphia to Los Angeles? If I need something at Los Angeles, wouldn't it make sense to just make it at Los Angeles? All the time we know because you have been conditioned by market prices, you understand that some things are going to be produced more economically in one area of the country than another. 
And you see this in the prices, and it just kind of leaps to you that intuitively that would be so. But, but you even need to ask that question, why would I want to take anything to Los Angeles? But, but that's just the first of your problems. Now you have to ask the question, how am I going to move these goods? Do I use a truck? Do I tr train? A dirigible? A spaceship? Uh, literally, a, w could a spaceship be a model? You know, we used to have uh, an air airplane, and I believe we're going to have one again very soon, uh, uh, that offered supersonic flight from uh, uh, New York to uh, Paris. You could get there in like an hour and something. Uh, and and that, that, that it was uneconomic because of market prices such that ultimately uh, that, that uh, service supersonic flight was uh, eliminated for passengers in the Concorde. Uh, but, but you could. And maybe one day in the future, and there are many entrepreneurs right now in the space industry that are talking about how can I get travel from New York to Beijing in just a few hours instead of you know, half a day, two thirds of a day to get there. These are the kind of trade-offs you've got to decide. Uh, what kind of truck if you use a truck? How about, how about getting a little Nissan Frontier and driving it? Get, get 20 of them. Why not 20 of those instead of an 18-wheeler? Why is an 18-wheeler going to be your choice? <clears throat> it all depends on the economic trade-off. And the question that we have to ask ourselves is how will you decide in the absence of market prices? My last question along those lines are, um, assume you're the manager of all things Apple related. Uh, what would be your next innovation? How would you decide what your next innovation should be? That's an interesting question. Where does change come from in a socialist system? One of the things you're going to see in, the, in our subsequent critique the market socialists who will be to come, they will say, we will assume that we will apply existing best technique. And I suppose you could do that. I think the world's a little bit more complex than that. But let's assume that they could even use the best current existing productive technique. How does that get to a future where innovation is going to change things? Or are you forever stuck? where you started from. How would you avoid wasting scarce resources? And, and so I, I, my bottom little uh, you know, punchline there is, is whenever we start thinking about resource allocation, you and I can't escape that we think about these things in terms of prices because that's what guides us. You have to try to imagine a world without prices to imagine the socialist system. They will, have a, they will have an answer. We'll see that next week. But, but start to see the, this critique that, that somehow we've got to deal with a world without prices. And, and so, so our next kind of uh, thing we want to think about is, is, is how does this monetary price really pr play in here in a socialist system? So, so, so we can have money to buy consumer goods. And, and, and Mises' critique isn't even really suggesting that we can't, under socialism, understand social valuations of consumer goods. That's not fundamental to his concern either. We can know, uh, you can use supply and demand kind of things, and we'll, we'll see uh, the arguments later that, 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 that you can do that uh, to, to understand consumer goods. Uh, so, so with that, that's, pr that's not really the issue. The real issue is that producer goods are not exchanged, and, 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 and what we mean is, is they're not rivalrous bids. And this rivalry, and this is kind of key, as, as we'll see as we go forward, the rivalry is necessary. The competing bids, this dynamic nature of markets, is key for us to understand valuation. Uh, Marx got this right, by the way. He understood the rivalry. Remember, that was part of his critique of the anarchy of the capitalist production. These competing bids, that inevitably some would be wrong, these competing bids uh, that, that would lead to, to wasted resources. Marx said we can do better than that. But for Mises and, and the other economists that followed his lead, it's precisely those competing bids which lead to a social valuation 
of what true consumer preferences are, and not just consumer preferences for finished goods, true possibilities of production. Uh, so so uh, again, the socialists would, would, would say, hey, we'll just use the best technique. I will tell you, uh, many of you know I'm also the dean of the business school. And if I have a management major, every day when our graduates graduate, they're going to go into a production line somewhere, some office function, and whatever the productive technique is, they're going to be trying to make it better every day. Uh, in, in, the, in the language of economics, they're going to try to push that supply curve outward every day. In the same way, I will uh, lead, leave a, a bunch of brilliant marketing majors that are going to try to, to show you what the true demand for this good ought to be, to try to encourage you that this good that they're producing actually could meet your latent needs. And they're going to be trying to push that demand curve outward every day Whatever the value, current valuation is, whatever the current production possibilities are, there are entrepreneurs in the world trying to change that daily. And, and so that, that's kind of the, the purpose of this price system. They're out there now saying, I can imagine a world where there could be something different, uh, and, and they're going to be bidding for that. So when, when the, the uh, producers, when the socialist uh, planner, central planners get to work, they're going to have to assign a mar monetary price if they do so by some sort of arbitrary basis. Uh, they can pick and lock in to where the existing market was. So Because so uh, remember, under Marx's system, you know, we're going to increasingly get monopolies get larger and larger. And as costs get driven down, that's going to replace workers. And eventually, that's going to lead to the revolution because of the depressions that will happen. But this monopolization will be, make it easy for the socialists to just assume the ownership of these companies. right? And that's when, when we'll, we'll, we'll get that. Uh, so so they, they, can, they would start with what the market uh, system had already done. But, but Mises' eventual com conclusion is that in this system, there is no economic calculation possible. And, and I've got the quotes impossible because that word impossible will be a key feature of the debates that we're going to have uh, going forward. Now, uh, Mises is going to elaborate. That's kind of the overarching system, but we're going to go a little bit more in depth. So it's possible, Mises argues, that in a, in a rude state of the society, you could have, you certainly, uh, consumers can always kind of know their own in, uh, evaluations of goods. They certainly know their own utility of, of what they would get from of the consumption of any good. They also uh, could, could imagine uh, maybe the, the, the means to the ends, you know, how this particular, if I, if I eat this hamburger, it's going to satisfy this hunger need, and they can kind of imagine that. He goes further. He says, you know, even in production possibilities, you can imagine a very sh small scale, or rude society, if you will, early society, where you could do those trade-offs mentally. So, uh, Robinson Crusoe is, is, is often used, the Crusoe economy, if you've read that book, where he's deserted and he has to do certain functions uh, to, to survive. You can imagine some trade-off between uh, uh, fishing via a spear or taking the time out to make a net. And, and, and so uh, Mar Marx had this view and, and actually said this, that, that the Crusoe economy, we're just going to kind of multiply that, scale that up, and that, that's what the socialist economy uh, would be like. Mises says, no, no, this is, as the quote here says, this is quite a different matter when you're looking at the, uh, the objects of modern production in a large-scale economy. It's, it's, it's a qualitatively different kind of problem. And uh, he was an Austrian economist, and Austrians are famous for talking about roundabout processes, and this roundabout just meant time-intensive processes that would take a long period of time. The more complicated the, the, the economy is, and, and indeed, the capitalist economy, with its division of labor, has made possible lengthy, lengthy production processes. Uh, sometimes a production process might have, have something years in advance. I mean, just think about today, if, if, if you see ExxonMobil or somebody start a new major well in, uh, up in uh, Alaska somewhere, it's going to take probably a decade or more before that, that would come online. Uh, the, the, these uh, modern uh, uh, large-scale uh, uh, 
capitalist processes can be quite lengthy. And, and so there, there's going to have lots of different pathways. Each length is, is variable. And how do you make that trade-off? Uh, he says that valuation is necessarily in units, yet his, the problem is value is subjective. That's part of the marginal revolution. And, and, and Mises says the answer is to be found in an exchange economy. This is how we solve this problem, because an exchange economy gives three benefits. First of all, very important, everybody gets a vote in terms of valuations. All the consumer valuations are inherent in the market price. Everybody's bid weighs in at some level. You know, there's critiques there, right? A wealthier person gets, so to speak, more votes than a poor person. But everybody's dollar vote counts at some level. And so everybody's valuation plays into that. And so we, we can say that prices are a social imputation of value. That is very important because in the market, the prices are set by what the population as those in their competing bids for goods and services have said they value, not what a central planner has said they value. That's a fundamentally different kind of a process. Uh, the second benefit of this, this exchange economy is, is that with a dollar valuation, you can quickly see whether you have used resources economically or not. If you have lost money, if your business venture is suffering a loss, you are wasting scarce social resources, and you should stop. Likewise, if you're having a profit, that's an indication you're stewarding resources well, and that's likely to entice more capital to come into your line of work so that you can expand those production opportunities. So, so that, that helps us understand, helps us understand it quickly. And, and then that, that social valuation, he says the third benefit, it, it applies to everything. Everything that's in the market economy has a price on it somewhere. That's not, as he says, it's not everything that's valuable. There are many things that are valuable that we consider, uh, you know, honor, integrity. Those don't have price tags, but they're not in the market. But everything that's in the market will have some sort of exchange value which helps others in the economy decide how they react in light of others' social valuations. That's the big benefit of this. Uh, and and so, so Mises says it's not perfect, but monetary calculation uh, fulfills everything we need for economic uh, calculation. It guides us through, the, as he says, the oppressive plenitude of economic potentiality. Uh, and, and the next sub bullet you see there, technical versus economics. This is a really important aspect as well. It, when I pass those, those uh, uh, ratchets around, there are more complex ways we could do business than use a ratchet. It's, it's slightly more complex if you used an air ratchet, for instance. It's, so, so if I were to ask you what's the best way to accomplish a task, it, you might say, well, what's the easiest? What's the most capital intensive that requires we can get it done the fastest? That might be the best technical solution, but is it the most economic decision? In other words, does the production of a better technical solution in one area take resources that could have been applied in some other area to satisfy a more urgent need? That's the question. It's not a question of, of, of technical uh, valuation. It's a, it's a matter of what is the most economic. Um, in, his, in his book, uh, uh, The Road to Serfdom, Hayek uh, was talking about all of the, the, the people that loved the Germans in the 30s because they had such fantastic roads. And they said, see, this was before all the, 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 the real horrors of, of, of Nazism were revealed, but they, they were already devoting all these resources towards, and they had great roads and everything. And everybody said, we ought to be like the socialists. Look what great roads they have. This is an, an example for, for socialism. Hayek says this is exactly an argument against socialism. Those resources that could create such good roads could have been used somewhere else, but it's only because the central plan are one of those good roads, and in the meanwhile, there are many unmet needs that should have been satisfied that were not. So it's not a question of what's technical. It's a question of what's economic. And I've got a little chart up here to try to illustrate how this works. Uh, mon monetary calculation shows that there, there's an order of production where it gets really difficult for us to produce the, the further and further we go. So on the top, we have consumer goods. And in this model, 
We call those goods of the first order. That's what we all want to buy. Uh, but, but each one of those goods of the first order, we've got the, the, the building, the, 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 this great castle that was built. And you can imagine some of the capital goods would be lumber, finished lumber and, and rocks that might be involved. You can imagine a step further back from that process. You can imagine uh, just some unfinished wood and some big rocks. And then further back, there might be hammers and, and saws and hatchets and other sorts of capital. It just keeps going back and back. Here's kind of the key point. The further you go down this, this list, you get further back in these other higher order goods, those things can be used to produce a whole bunch of different things. They are not specific to just building this particular castle. So there's a trade-off that somebody has to do. And the, the more time intensive, and, and, and time, that's another thing we've got to calculate in there. How, if you want something faster, it's going to cost you more money. Should we come up with a solution faster, or should we take more time? If we could come up with a coronavirus solution in two weeks, I think it, we'd say it'd be worth the money. Probably shouldn't wait two years. That's probably not too helpful. Other things, it might make sense to wait a little bit longer. Uh, so, so Mises' quote, uh, the mind of one man alone, be it ever so cunning, is too weak to grasp the importance of any single one among the countlessly many goods of a higher order. No single man can ever master all the possibilities of production without some system of computation. So we might say, well, hey, doesn't socialism work? Well, Mises addressed address this. You know, uh, we could look at Amtrak. We've had socialism in, in that sense. We've had government ownership of Amtrak for many, many years, and they still run these trains. I used to ride one of them uh, uh, to, to work. Uh, so, so, hey, what about the Soviet Union? Yeah, it failed now, but hey, 70 years is a pretty long test drive. Seemed to work for 70 years. What about it? Mises' response is these are just socialist oasis uh, in a society with monetary exchange. Uh, and, and so socialism in the middle of a capitalist system can have economic calculation because they can just look at market prices for capital goods in a market economy. And that is indeed what the so so Soviet Union did. Uh, so the other thing you could think about is, is as Mises agrees, you know, it, socialism could work in the stationary state, you know, at the equilibrium when, when there is no change. So that's kind of the best that you could ever get with socialism in his, his model because you could get to a point where we could identify what these relative trade-offs are, just, just have the socialists basically take over. Now, that, that doesn't mean it will work because we still have the incentive problems, but remember, Mises is assuming all the best would happen, right? But, but just an economic calculation, there's no calculation to be made when we're in the steady state equilibrium point. That's his, his, his model. Let me just say a couple words on uh, the conflict of visions, the constrained versus the unconstrained, uh, because this is going to really get to some of the heart of uh, I, I want you to read that book. I've, like I said, I've got copies on uh, over at the library if you did not buy one uh, that are available on reserve. But, but Thomas Sowell gives a framework for us to understand how people have different views of, of, of the world. And so, so the constrained view has this, this idea of limitations on what humanity can do. That, and, and I would assert that that's consistent with the, uh, the biblical view of being a fallen individual. There are moral limitations, there are technical limitations, and so that leads to tra trade-offs being desired rather than a solution. Uh, and, and so this has a negative view on the human condition, but the, it has a very positive view on the overall humanity, uh, such that, that the, the, the experience of generations, millennia, of humanity involved in social processes leads to embedded knowledge and wisdom that we ought to take advantage of. That's kind of akin to what Mises is saying. It's very skeptical of what an individual can do and know, yet the emergent order that comes out of millions of people being participating in the market process it leads to a better result. On the other hand, the unconstrained view has this idea that humanity can do the right thing if we have the right institutional arrangements and the right incentives. In that sense, humanity is perfectible. It's something that can be approved. Uh, you, you can often, often find the solution, and you don't have to have a trade-off. Uh, and, and so that, because of that, in fact, you don't even want these trade-offs because people need to do the right thing to get them to kind of evolve, if you will, uh, to, to be able to make those choices. Uh, so, so this has, has a more positive view. 
I would assert there's even a little bit of this view consistent with a biblical view, right? We, we would believe that everyone's capable of improvement as God works in them through the Holy Spirit to sanctify and lead us to better choices. Uh, we would not necessarily, though, think that you'd ever expect to see perfection this side of glorification. Glorification will be when you meet Jesus, either uh, on this life or uh, when, when he comes again, right? Or, you know, on the, if you pass away. So, so that's kind of the way this trade-off works. There's a little bit of both of them, if you will, but the constrained view certainly uh, reflects the view of humanity. Uh, the the, the uh, Marxian system is going to be looking towards more of an unconstrained in, in the sense of the possibilities, uh, but Mises is going to be more of a constrained view. I hope that helps frame some of the economic, goes well beyond economics, this uh, Sowell's uh, argument.